Okay, uh, this is a uh, this is a lecture for my uh, second hour class on uh, April the twelfth. Uh, well, when we left off the other day, Hood, as General Sherman said, or Jefferson Davis, as General Sherman said, uh, did the did the North a tremendous favor by firing uh, Joseph E. Johnston, who only had he had plenty of supplies and ammunition. Uh, and he was entrenched, and Sherman couldn't. He had been trying for months to get into Atlanta and couldn't. He only had to hold out 56 more days. Of course, this is all speculation, uh, but uh, probably, I mean, Lincoln might have lost. Uh, uh, in fact, I think the thing that reelected Lincoln was the fall of Atlanta. But uh, Jefferson Davis was impatient, and he took an entirely different view. And, you know, Jefferson Davis, he, he didn't want to be the president of the Confederacy. He was, he wanted to be a general in the field. He had fought in the Mexican War, and he fancied himself to be a great general, which he was not. But his view of warfare was just to come out of the trenches and fight. Uh, <clears throat> Is there anybody else following you? Oh, I don't think so. Okay. Are you test over? No, I just finished mine. Okay. So anyway, the... Um, the um, you know he wanted to come out of the trenches and fight, and he picked a man that would do that. Uh, John Bell Hood of Texas. You know, the last time I maybe we, well we talked about him. I didn't say I didn't mention his name. He, the last time he was at Little Round Top, but he also was in the cornfield with his Texas brigade. <coughs> pardon me, at Antietam. So this guy, if you want a fighter, uh, he had a fighter, and he came, and that's what Sherman had been hoping. He had tried to get. Uh, Johnston to come out and fight, and Johnston said, no, <coughs> we're sitting pretty. I can hold Atlanta forever. Well, this time, it, uh, Hood came out and fought, and uh, it destroyed his army, uh, or, or, you know, greatly diminished his army. He could no longer man the defenses, and he had to evacuate the city of Atlanta, and he did, and when, when Sherman captured Atlanta, uh, rejoicing broke out in the north, and this is just before Election Day, uh, rejoicing September 1st, 1864, eight weeks before the election. Uh, and rejoicing broke out uh, all across the North because for the first time, it seemed like the North was winning the war. Uh, and so Sherman uh, shot a few looters and he put out the fires that the Confederates uh, set. Uh, the, the thing they always get wrong is he didn't burn Atlanta. He probably saved Atlanta. Uh, and then he, uh, but he did, uh, you know, expel a lot of the population and his army took over the town and they rested and refitted themselves. They'd been on in this campaign for several months. Uh, and then he marched to the sea. You know, Savannah, Georgia was uh, 200, 248 miles from Atlanta, 248 miles to Savannah. And he went right through, uh, Sherman did, right through the heart of Georgia. If you ever hear of a general of the Civil War marching to the sea, it was Sherman. And he said, I'm going to make uh, Georgia howl. I'm going to make Georgia scream. Uh, I'm going to destroy the war making capabilities of the South. I'm going to show the Southern people that the, the, the very government that they are fighting and dying for is incapable of protecting them. So he burned towns and cities and plant. Now he didn't do all of that. He burned towns and cities and plantations uh, he uprooted railroads. He took the railroad ties and heated them and twisted them around telegraph poles. Those were called Sherman neckties. He burned factories. The South didn't have many factories. And, the, and one thing he burned was four years of cotton that Southern planters had selfishly hoarded. Because when the war started, I mean, I don't know what cotton was selling for for a pound. For a pound, maybe it was 25 cents a pound when the war started. And they should have rushed it to England and sold it and bought war supplies. But they thought like this. If we, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, the Vladimir Putin, one of his strategies in this war, if I withhold my oil, it will, you know, it will cause, cause the price of oil to go very high and it will crash the economy. Of course, you know, one of the miss pieces of misinformation out there is that you know Putin is withholding oil and our gas prices here are going up because that's causing a shortage. We only get about seven percent of our oil from Russia. So I mean I guess if you seven percent of your oil is cut off that's gonna cause but that's not the main cause for the rise of 
uh, prices in gasoline. So anyway, just thought I'd throw that in as an extra. But anyway, that's what kind of what the South said. They said, we'll create a world cotton shortage. And not only will the British and the French, uh, especially the British, come to our aid, but we'll hold on to this cotton. And you create a shortage and the price of cotton is going to go through the roof. And so by the end of the war, we will be able to say, and they suspected they would be able, they were hoarding that cotton, thinking that by the end of the war, they'd be able to sell it for a dollar a pound. And guess what? It all got burned up. Sherman burned it all, marching. It was already ginned and processed and bailed and stacked in the barns, ready to be shipped. Uh, and Sherman uh, burned it. Uh, and by the way, he freed tens of thousands of slaves as he marched through Georgia. And they sort of tag along with uh, the army for protection. Get this down. He entered in, in this march through Georgia. This is the beginning of, of uh, total war or modern war as we understand it today. In war up in, in, in most wars, and, this, and, and of course this is not absolutely true. There are exceptions. But in most wars, if you were not literally on the battlefield or near the battlefield, if your farm wasn't in the middle of the battlefield, uh, the war just sort of passed you by, okay? Now, there are exceptions. There are foraging parties in the Revolutionary War that go out and burn American farms, but there are exceptions to that. But as a general rule, if you weren't right in the vicinity of the battle, uh, you know, the war, as I say, passed you by. Not this. Uh, Sherman is going to make war on civilians. He's going to make war on the civilian population. His mission, and I think he accomplished it, was to break the spirit of the Confederacy. Uh, he said, I'm going to break their will to resist. I'm going to break their will to continue the war. He had, and so what he did is that he took 70,000 men and he spread them out on a front 60 miles wide. 70,000 men spread out for 60 miles, and then they're just going to march through Georgia. They're going to march through Georgia. And of course, it was the fall of the year. Uh, the weather, you know, the thing about being in Sherman's army after the hell of war that these guys had been through, it's the fall of the year. The weather's nice. You know, it's not too hot. Uh, plus, in the South, you know, Georgia, up until this point, Georgia had been spared the war. Uh, it was the fall. The crops were harvested, the corn bins were full. The smokehouses were crammed full. And uh, Sherman, uh, he doesn't even take along a commissary. He doesn't even take, you know, really some, anyone to, to uh, supply the army with food. He simply says, we'll live off the land. And that's what they do. They march through and they stripped Georgia. They stripped Georgia bare. Um, Sherman's men consumed. How much food does it take to sustain 70,000 men? They sustained 300 tons. They, they devoured, excuse me, uh, 300 tons of food a day. 300. And, 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 and man, these guys, they were eating, uh, you know, uh, uh, ham uh, and beef and mutton, uh, you know, and bacon. Uh, this, this may have been the best fed army that ever marched in the history of warfare. And of course, uh, the, 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 the flip side of that is the southern, pop, the southern civilians were starving. He marched right through the heart of Georgia. He took the war to the Confederate people. You want war? Here it is. Here it is. Served up on a silver platter from Atlanta to Savannah by the sea. Well, of course, that raises the question, well, where the heck was Hood and the Confederate Army? What were they doing? Well, Hood had retreated here to Alabama, okay? And Sherman was just uh, just destroying Georgia. Uh, Hood had retreated to Alabama, but he came up with a plan. He said, uh, you know, Sherman's supply base is Nashville, <coughs> which it was, and he said, if we capture, if we march north, and you know, Nashville ought to be lightly defended, the main army's down here, if we march to Nashville and we capture Nashville and cut off his supplies, he will be forced to retreat out of Georgia back into Tennessee. That's the only way we can get him out. And so uh, Hood headed north to Nashville and about, to get this down, about 25 miles south of Nashville, he came up, and if you haven't been to, you know, if you, how many of you have been to Nashville? Okay, did you go to the Franklin Battlefield? You need to, the plantation house is still there. You can still see, it was a field hospital. You can, see, you can still see blood stains on the floor from the Battle of uh, 
to the Battle of Franklin, write that down. So he's heading north to Nashville, but about 25 miles south of Nashville, he came upon a Union force. It wasn't an army. It was commanded, I think, by a guy named Schofield. And Schofield had dug in uh, around the Franklin Plantation House, okay? The Battle of Franklin, the Franklin Plantation House. A lot of people... You know, that's almost an unknown battle, and that's a shame. They had dug in around that plantation house. Uh, but the next day, they were planning to come out of their trenches and continue on. They were heading for Nashville to reinforce Nashville. Uh, and, uh, you know, I guess if Hood would not have attacked, he could have just followed them up and then, you know, maybe captured or attacked at Nashville. But Hood decided to attack, uh, and uh, he, he sent... 18,000 men. You know, if you say to most people what was the greatest charge of the Civil War, they would say, well, without a doubt, it's Pickett's Charge. Well, how many men were in Pickett's Charge? Well, some people say 12,000, and some people say 10,000, and some people say 15,000, probably about 12,000 men. I want to tell you the biggest charge of the Civil War, and I bet you never heard of the Battle of Franklin until today. I'm not criticizing you. I'm not criticizing the education system, maybe. But the, the biggest charge of the Civil War took place at Franklin. Hood sent 18,000 men through the haze of an Indian summer. It was fall, a nice, beautiful, sunny day. And they went through, uh, and they were slaughtered. This was much larger than Pickett's Charge, and they were slaughtered. Six Confederate generals were killed in a day, and they laid them out on the porch at the Franklin Plantation House, shoulder to shoulder. Uh, one of the fieriest ones killed is this guy right here. A young guy was killed. You don't have to write him down, but I'm just, you know, talking about being committed to state's rights. His parents' name, that was his name, state's right gist. State, his parents' name. You know, keep these notebooks when you all have children. You know, you have a you know, little son, state's rights Macintosh running around, you know, and you can show him a picture. Say, hey, kid, here's the guy you're named after. Yeah, state's rights Macintosh. Anyway. States right gist. You know, boy, those people were really for states right. You know? Huh? Yeah, it's a, well, it's a miracle he didn't shoot them, you know, when he got old enough to find the gun in the door to say, hey, mom, what do you name the states right for that? Anyway, I you know, so to about guns, but anyway, just a joke. Anyway, they were laid out shoulder to shoulder on the porch at the Franklin Plantation, uh, and, um, you know, Hood's army was destroyed. I mean, by this, uh, you know, I mean, after this, they got. 15,000 men, maybe. And they're no longer a threat. So, let's see here. Oops. So, uh, you know, Hood's army, you know, rout just retreats back to Alabama here. And uh, Sherman just continues on his merry way to Savannah. By the way, uh, who did uh, they give command of? Uh, so, so finally, Jefferson Davis says, well, you know, maybe Hood isn't a great job. <laughs> Fired him, and who did he replace him with and tell him, you know, well, you've got maybe 20,000 men. Go over there and stop Sherman. Drive him out of Georgia. Who did they replace him with? Johnston. Johnston, yeah. They called uh, Joseph, you know, talk about irony. Uh, they called Joseph E. Johnston, said, take over this army. So Joseph E. Johnston takes over the army. And of course, there was nothing he could do. All that he will do, he'll come into Georgia and then he'll come up here in the western part of Carolina. And as Sherman is marching through the heart of South Carolina, he just sort of hovers off and tries to make it, you know, they like blow up bridges and they try and make it as difficult for uh, Sherman's men to advance, but they can't stop him. In fact, his engineering corps was just a miracle. They would destroy a road in a couple of, unlike our. Well, I don't want to say that, but uh, in a couple of hours, they had the road repaired and the army was marching on. They just, you know, and even Johnston wrote that. I can't remember his exact words, but he just said it was a miracle to watch. You know, there was nothing we could do to stop them. And they certainly couldn't come out with 20,000 men and fight 70, 70,000 men. And by the way, uh, by Christmas of 1864, they reached Savannah and Sherman telegraphed President Lincoln, who had just recently been reelected. And he said, I present you the city of Savannah as a Christmas gift, a Christmas gift. And then he turned north and went into South Carolina. And if you think they were rough on Georgia, well, they were just practicing in Georgia because they are really going to give hell to South Carolina. 
Why so much venom about South Carolina? Huh? They started this mess. Yeah, exactly right. They started this mess, you know, and South Carolina knew what was coming, by the way. Uh, when the uh, Union Army approaches Columbia, there's the capital city of Columbia right there. When the Union Army approaches Columbia, they went into John C. Calhoun's vault where his body was, and they removed his body and they hid it in the country so the Union forces wouldn't desecrate it. I'm not saying the Union forces would have, but that's what they, they feared. And of course, uh, Sherman and his men are going to burn and loot their way across uh, South Carolina. Uh, they're going to burn Columbia, okay, a major portion of Columbia. And, uh, you know, they go and then, then they enter into North Carolina. And, of course, they're on their way. Uh, they're on their way right here to Richmond. They're coming up uh, to link up with Grant and uh, finish, off, finish off Lee. Um, and, of course, uh, there was no one to stop them. There was no one to stop them. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, their march is just going to be unimpeded. Well, in Richmond, everybody knew that. Uh, Lee certainly knew it. Doom, doom was visible. Lee was down to 30,000 men. By this time, Grant is outside, you know, and again, this is, this is all on the, just remember this, this is all on the Richmond, and there's a railroad connecting them. This is all on the Richmond-Petersburg line. And, you know, Lee has, has got his troops stretched. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, Grant's out here with 130,000 men, and Lee's here with 30,000 men, 30 to 35,000 men. And, of course, Grant has just been working and working and working around this flank here. Uh, and Lee's just been extending his lines and extending his lines and extending his lines, trying to keep uh, Grant out. But Grant is probing Lee's uh, left flank, trying to get into the rear of the enemy. And he thinks if he can do that, he can crush him between two wings of the army. And now Lee is looking south, seeing another army of 70 or 80 or 90,000 men uh, is on the way. Uh, Lee, was his army was in bad shape. Uh, they had few rifles. There was an ammunition shortage. Uh, men were being Confederate soldiers. You know, you're ever in this situation, maybe it's time to put down your sword and run away. Uh, Confederate soldiers at this point, there were no more rifles to issue them, so they were giving them wooden pikes, eight-foot-long wooden pikes with a metal tip. Now, if you take that, oh, I don't know, you attack somebody who's over on the other side and he's got a rifle that can kill you 600 yards away, there's a good chance you're going to lose that contest. Uh, plus, uh, they didn't have any food. Uh, Confederate soldiers at this point were observed picking uh, half-digested corn out of the manure of their horses, okay, and then boiling that and eating it. And again, if you're ever in an army and you're down to that, uh, you might calculate and say, gee, are we really making any progress here when you're having to eat half-digested corn picked out? Because you've got to feed the horses. You need a horse. So you've got to feed the horses a little bit. Uh, that's what they're doing boiling corn picked out of horse manure. Well, on February 3rd, get this down, 1865, remembering that the war ends on April 9th, 1865, so we're in the closing weeks of the war, uh, Lincoln met with the Confederates to talk peace. Lincoln met with the Confederates to talk peace at Hampton Roads, Virginia. Okay, Hampton Roads, Virginia. Write that down. The Hampton Roads Conference. Now, the next time we get together, we're going to have a test. Is that true? Yes? Okay. Hampton Roads, Virginia. Right here. Okay, right up here. Right there. See that Hampton Roads? Right there on the James River, Hampton Roads. So the Hamp Hampton Roads, okay, and... Uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia, 1865, February, February. Lincoln went with his famous Secretary of State, who had been Lincoln's greatest political rival uh, in the nomination. This man was an out-and-out -out abolitionist. He was a senator from New York. He had first served in the House of Representatives from New York. His house was one of the stations, as they called it, on the Underground Railroad. There's no doubt he was smuggling slaves out of the country. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people thought he would get the Republican nomination instead of Lincoln in 1860, but he was considered to be too liberal, too extreme. You know, we don't want some, you know, we, we, the, 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 the political bosses in the Republican party said, we'll never win this election. Uh, if we elect someone like, like Seward, who says we're going to end the slaves immediately because they said the country, like it or not, is just not ready for that. So they nominated a more moderate candidate, Lincoln, who said, well, we're just going to confine slavery to the South. But then Lincoln added for those abolitionists, because if we think we think if we can confine it to the South, we will place it on the course of ultimate extinction. And, you know, a lot of American people could go along with that. So they nominated Lincoln and the party won their first presidential election ever. But uh, that's not state right. Just not, uh, this man, William Seward, write him down. There's and 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 Lincoln, you know, um, you know, didn't surround himself as I've said before. He didn't surround himself with yes men. He appointed his greatest political rivals to this cabinet. His greatest political rivals to his cabinet, and Seward was his greatest. And you know, the men, you know, they were very uncomfortable at first, but they become the very best of friends. In fact, uh, Seward. Uh, is Lincoln becomes Lincoln's chief supporter uh, in the cabinet. Okay. Uh, and of course, later on, uh, during he, he remains after Lincoln's death, he remains as secretary of state. And one of the things he remember, is remembered for, and boy, this was a very wise move. He was very criticized at the time for doing it, but as secretary of state, he arranged the purchase of uh, Alaska from Russia. Okay. Uh, what if, you know, of current state of affairs, if, uh, you know, Russia was here, okay? Of course, nobody could foresee that at the time. They called it, he paid $7 million for Alaska, which was at the time was an enormous source of, uh, I mean, a, an enormous amount of money. And, of course, his critics said that it was Seward's folly, and they called it Seward's icebox. You're spending $7 million. You know, where there is no vision, the people perish. This guy had vision. I can't, I'm not saying he could have foreseen the Cold War or anything else, but he had vision that it was wise. And then, of course, you know, you've got all the mineral gains, the oil and things that we've gotten from the grand old state of Alaska. Well, anyway, this guy purchased it, okay, and was mocked and made fun of, but uh, generally uh, admired as someone who made a very wise decision on that today. So, anyway, Lincoln and Seward went down, and they met with three Confederates. This little man right here, write him down. Uh, he weighed 99 pounds. That's the vice president of the Confederacy, uh, Alexander Stevens. Okay, little rascal. Alexander Stevens. And you don't have to write these other guys down. But uh, a, a Confederate senator named uh, RMT Talafaro, Talafaro, I think, Talafaro Hunter, RMT uh, Hunter and then a judge named Judge Campbell. And they met on a steamboat uh, out there in the James River. Um, and uh, uh, the River Queen, it was called. And they were, you know, the Confederates want to know, and here they are in the last ditch. They want to know what will it take to end this war. And Lincoln was absolutely uh, un uncompromising. Uh, he was, And in fact, he could be because Lincoln was holding all the cards, okay? There was nothing they could do. And so Lincoln said, if you want to end the war, uh, surrender, rejoin the Union, and free your slaves. And there's a legend, it may be true, that Lincoln wrote those three things. You know, the, the Confederates essentially said, well, what would it take to end this bloodletting, this war? And Lincoln took a piece of paper and wrote those three things. Surrender, rejoin the Union, free your slaves, and slid it across the table with a pen and said, now, write anything you guys want to under that, and I will agree to it if you will meet those three things. Now, that may or may not be true, but Certainly, that was the atmosphere in there. And, of course, it came to nothing. Uh, their attitude was, we've spent too much blood. We can't surrender if we do that. Uh, we can't quit. We can't rejoin the Union because if we agreed to that, all these young men that had died, uh, their deaths would be in vain. So the war continued. So there was one last chance for the South. Get this down. There was one last chance for the South. Oops. And, uh, and it wasn't really a chance, but if Lee could somehow break out of Richmond by surprise, because he had been dug in there for months, if he could break out of Richmond and head west, in other words, get a head start on the Union Army, 
and somewhere out in West Virginia turn and link up with Johnson's army that was here in North Carolina, uh, that would give him about 40 or 50,000 men. And, uh, you know, maybe Lee could pull a miracle. Maybe he could pull another Chancellorsville, even though he would be vastly out. He would be outnumbered 200,000 to 40,000. Maybe he could reverse the trap and win the war. Absolutely ridiculous. Didn't have a chance of happening. But as the old saying goes, desperate times call for desperate, uh, uh, desperate times call for desperate. Uh, no, uh, measures. Huh? Measures. What? Measures. Measures. Thank you. Well, my mind is going. I made two pots of coffee this morning. I want to say this. I uh, got my thermos out. I made a pot of coffee and gave the dogs their allergy medicine. And I filled it with, and I put it in my briefcase. And then I turned right around and I made another pot of coffee. And then I said, where is my thermos bottle? Where is it? And I looked and it's hot. Ah, it's in the briefcase. And I got it out and opened it. There was hot coffee in there. So. Yeah, that, that I didn't remember measures for that. That's what I got you here for, Miss Oklahoma. Anyway, one more miracle. That's what they want out of Lee. Well, sorry, there ain't no miracle coming. And so here's what Lee did. So here are the, here are the lines. Now here's Lee. Here's Grant, and there was a Union fort right in the center of the uh, Union lines, and it was called Fort Stedman. By the way, this is the last attack of the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, Fort Stedman, and Lee's plan was this. I will strike, you know, because Lee hadn't attacked in months. I will all of a sudden come out of the trenches early in the morning, you know, catch them while they're dozing, hit Fort Stedman, knock a hole in the Union lines, and while the Union forces are coming to plug that, I will take the main part of my army and I will escape Richmond and head west, okay? Uh, or maybe I will punch a hole through there and just turn south. And anyway, some way out of this, it doesn't have a chance of working, but some way out of this, I'm going to uh, link up with Johnston. So uh, on the morning, let's see if I've got the date. Oh, yes, March 25th, 1865. <coughs> Remembering that the war ends on April 9th, so this is March 25th. Uh, the Confederates attacked Fort Stedman. And at first, they knocked a hole in the Union lines. And I just want to imagine Lee just not going to see him, you know, watching in his field and, and seeing that blood start rising. You know, Lee's blood is up. You know, he thinks maybe... Uh, but just as soon as the hole was knocked in the line, it shut back. And those few Confederates that managed to just knock a little hole, they looked, and there were just endless Union supplies, soldiers. I mean, even if they had broken through, they would have been wiped out. Uh, and at that point, Grant ordered, you know, when Lee came out and attacked, Grant ordered a full attack everywhere at once on the Confederate lines. And on that day... They swung around, uh, Grant's army got, uh, turned Lee's flank, okay? And they fought a little battle down there called the Battle of Yellow Tavern. It was a cavalry engagement. And young Jeb Stewart was there. You remember him from Gettysburg? And he got killed at Yellow Tavern, okay? I forget how old he was. He was in his late 20s, or early 30s. And now Lee had to face the fact that the Union Army was in the rear, and he had no other choice but to run west. And so get this down. They evacuated Richmond. The great retreat starts. Jefferson Davis, it was a Sunday morning. Jefferson Davis was in church uh, at, um, at um, St. Somebody's Episcopal Church. Let me look here. Jefferson, well, I don't... Yeah, he was at St. Paul's that's Episcopal Church. I... I've never been there, but they say you can go down and see the pew where he was sitting. And right in the middle of the service, a young Confederate officer comes tiptoeing down the aisle and he hands Jefferson Davis and his wife this message directly from Lee. And Lee is telling him, I'm evacuating Richmond. And Davis got up immediately, went to the Confederate White House, grabbed some papers, and he heads south. And he was, uh, they think, heading for Mexico. Uh, they'll capture him down in Georgia. 
Okay, he's riding up, captured the Georgia, and bring him back, and he's put in he's put in jail. But that's where he was at. That's where he was sitting, not where he was at. That's where he was sitting when the uh, he got the message that uh, that um, uh, Richmond had fallen. By the way, another battle. You know, the Yellow Tavern is part of a bigger battle down here called the Battle of Five Forks. You know, just just I just put that out there in case you ever hear that the Battle of Five Forks. But all of this is taking place on the yellow uh, on the uh, uh, left flank of the uh, uh, the Confederate Army. So Lee is forced to retreat. We got this down. Let's see what's next. Okay, here we go. Uh, he comes out of Richmond heading west. Okay, he comes out of Richmond heading west, uh, hoping to get, and of course, the, you know, Grant doesn't stop to celebrate. He doesn't have a victory parade. They don't look around and say, gee, we've been fighting for four years to get this place. Let's have a look at it. He went right on through because Grant knew as long as Lee's army existed, there would be a war. Uh, so he doesn't even stop to catch his breath. They, they keep pursuing Lee. And it's a, it's a race like this out through Western Virginia. Here's Lee and the, and you know, there's the union army behind him, but the union cavalry is trying to get around in front of him and, uh, and block him. Okay. The union army is trying to get around him and uh, block him. And of course, a few days later, Lincoln himself will come down to Richmond and he will go to the Confederate White House. This must have been a great moment for him. And he'll walk into Jefferson Davis's office and he will sit down in the breast of the Confederacy's chair behind his desk and read a few of his papers and get up and go home. And of course, he was greeted by slaves, ex-slaves now. He was greeted by ex-slaves who literally fell at his feet, almost worshiping him. And Lincoln had them get up. He said, don't bow to any man. No, he had them get up. Uh, and of course, whites, uh, uh, Southern whites in Richmond, they just sort of stayed in their indoors and peered through the windows. I mean, they wanted to see this man, Lincoln, that they had read so much about and heard uh, vilified. And meanwhile, the race uh, was going uh, to the West. Um, and um, who gets out in front of Lee's army finally and blocks him? And a little place, get this down, because this is where the war is. The court is still there. I was just up there not long ago. You need to go. Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, okay? And, and, and it's a courthouse. You know, also it's Appomattox is a little town, but it's a small town. Uh, but outside of it is the old, but in those days it was a courthouse and a couple of farms. Uh, which Union general gets out in front of him with the cavalry? Uh, Custer. Custer, excellent, very good. Yeah, and he's only, by the way, Custer's only 23. He's the youngest general of the Union Army, 23 years old, and he blocks him. And uh, uh, the Confederates, uh, you know, come up over a rise and they exchange a little gunfire, but, uh, you know, Lee knew it was over. And so Lee told his staff, you know, there is nothing left for me to do but to go and see General Grant, and I would rather die a thousand deaths, end quote. And so they sent word through the lines uh, that Lee wanted to meet with Grant. And Grant knew what was happening. In fact, he had met with Lincoln shortly before Richmond was evacuated, just talking about they knew the war was coming to an end. And, uh, you know, uh, Grant told him, I expect to hear from General Lee almost any day now. And Lincoln's advice was this. Uh, and, and I think you have to give President Lincoln and, and Grant credit for it, no, especially Grant, because he's the man on the scene, knowing how to end a war. Uh, everything could have gone south at Appomattox Courthouse, and I'll talk about that later. But uh, Lincoln said to Grant, let him up easy. Let him up easy. You know, uh, you know here, here was a country, here, here were a group of people that had tried to destroy the United States government and the Constitution. They killed... 350,000 uh, Union soldiers. I shudder to think in the current climate in this country today what our attitude would have been because we want to, it seems like in our politics, we want to get our enemy down and kick him and kick him and kick him just as hard as we can. When we get the advantage, we want to exploit it to the fullest. Well, that's what would have happened here. We might have lost this country. We might have lost this country, I think, as you will see. But anyway, um, you know, uh, Grant receives word, and Grant was in such a hurry. He had jumped up that morning, uh, probably hadn't bathed in a couple of days, shaved. His beard's kind of scruffy, plus he's a little scruffy-looking, stooped-over guy anyway. And he'd gotten on his favorite horse, Cincinnati, 
It's in the springtime, just this time of the year we're in. In fact, last Saturday at about 1 o'clock was the, I think, the 157th. Don't hold me to my arithmetic on that, but the, the end of the Civil War, 1865. 2022 minus 1865, how much is that? Can you tell us? 2022 minus 1865. Yeah, right. How much? Is it 157? Not just a guess. Minus what? I mean, uh, I heard somebody say 2022 minus like last week. Did the math? Oh, we did the math last week. Yeah. Oh, really? We can't trust any math I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Well, I did it. That means it was 210 years ago. What? 157. I knew it was right, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, hundred last Saturday about one o'clock, 157 years ago, the bloodiest war in American history, the greatest threat to the existence of the United States, uh, short of World War II, but maybe with the Civil War is even a greater existence. Yeah, Civil War, the greatest existence of the uh, existence of this country ended, and so uh, you know Grant uh, hopped on his horse Cincinnati when he got that message, and he sent word ahead, find a place to his officers up there, find a place. For General Lee and I to meet, and uh, it, it's this time of year we're having rain. It'd been raining, and of course, as that Cincinnati went on a pretty good gallop, uh, he was, uh, you know, hitting those mud puddles and splattering mud back up on Grant. So when Grant gets to Appomattox Courthouse, he's not going to look uh, too uh, too impressive. Uh, and by the way, they're not going to use the courthouse. And I asked the guide up there when I was there a couple of years ago. I said, "Well, you know." Why didn't they use the courthouse? And he said, well, they were going to, but it was locked. Like nobody in Appomattox had a key. You know, <laughs> can't use the courthouse. Sorry, courthouse is closed today. So um, anyway, um, we'll leave it there for today and finish it next time I lecture. But uh, everything's in motion for the surrender of Grant, uh, Lee to Grant and the end of the war. And we will uh, take it up there. Uh, after your test, next time I see you. Yeah, <laughs>
What? Switzerland. Switzerland. Okay, good. Oh, 